morning. Today I will be sharing on worship. It's been very long since I've shared on this topic, uh, such an important topic. And not just today, but uh, even the next Sunday, I will be sharing on some important fundamental aspects about worship. Uh, today, specifically, I will be sharing about worship in the sense of what is worship. Let's, let's visit that again in our hearts and minds and try to understand not just the fundamentals, but even look at other dynamics that possibly we have um, you know, missed out on or ignored for some time. And what I'm hoping in these two weeks as I share on this topic that the Lord would um, reignite our hearts and renew our love for him, our passion to worship him, and um, really that we would be able to seek him anew and encounter his love and presence as we seek him in sincerity, in truth, and that our hearts would really be moved uh, to draw closer to him um, as before or like never before. So today I want to talk about what is um, worship. And I'm going to do that in three parts. Uh, the first part, I'll just share some introductory thoughts about worship. In the second part, I'm looking at sharing a passage where I believe the Lord can help us have a gracious course correction. So if any of us have kind of gone away from the Lord or gone astray or become stagnant, uh, you know, or we've moved away from God for any reason, that the Lord would help us to find our vision of him back again, that we would be able to once again employ our complete being, our hearts, our minds, our emotions, our thoughts, our feelings, our strength in order to worship God and encounter his presence in a daily, in a, uh, on a daily basis. Um, and third part is where I would just share four uh, very basic fundamental aspects about worship. So first, introductory thoughts. Second, a passage for a gracious course correction uh, and uh, just a realigning uh, back to God, a refocusing back to God. And thirdly, I'll share on four aspects um, about worship. I hope to do that uh, in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. So firstly, some introductory thoughts about worship. You know, a couple of weeks back when I spoke about 10 reasons as to why Christians should share the gospel, I actually used the words divine alignment. And uh, what I mean by that is where our, where first is first in our life, that God is first in our life, that God is supreme, um, not somebody supreme in the sense of that he's away or distant from us, but he's really first in our hearts, minds, our, our waking thoughts, when we go to bed, uh, when we're doing anything in our family, in our work, in just us living out and fulfilling our roles and responsibilities in life, that God would really be the first and central are all in all. And uh, uh, what I mean by divine alignment is that, that we would be really seeing Matthew 6 happen in our life, that we would be you know, seeking the king, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and the things that are on his heart. And anything uh, apart from that would be a wrong alignment, you know, a wrong set of priorities in our life. And, and what I want to say is that divine alignment, and, and we see that all across scripture, like God commands us to keep him first. God assures us that when he's first in our life, then everything else falls in line. That, it, that doesn't mean we have picture perfect lives, but it falls in line according to his plan and his perfect uh, will for our lives. So though our lives may appear to be imperfect and on earth it will be, there will be a sense of imperfectness, there will be incompleteness, but there can still be in that imperfections, there can still be a rightful arrangement of things. There can still be an alignment and an assurance that we can carry that we are in the will of God, that we are our posture, our position, our direction in life is approved by God and he's pleased by it. And that's what I mean by divine alignment. God is first, we have arranged or rearranged our life's priorities uh, 
to achieve that purpose, to keep him first, to keep him central, and to, and, and to allow him to truly be Lord over every area and aspect of our life. And what I mean to say is that this alignment is possible only by worship. This divine alignment is only possible by worship. Now, it's kind of circular. And what I mean by as you worship God, you know, even if there is chaos in your life and even if things are, uh, you know, in a disarray and you don't know what to do, and I actually shared some of that when I spoke about suffering, when you don't know what to do, do the best thing and, that you could do for yourself, and that is worship God. And what happens is when we begin to worship and when we begin to seek him, there is a rearrangement that begins to happen and things begin to fall in line and things begin to come in its right orbit. Let me just zoom out and take you to Revelation 4. We won't read that passage, but one of the things we see in Revelation 4, which is in Revelation 4 and 5, which are like the premier passages or, or chapters that help us see what is happening in heaven. And we see this fundamental eternal truth that everything in heaven arranges itself around the throne of God. Everything in heaven arranges itself around the throne of God. And as it is in heaven, so it be in our lives, so it be on earth, so it be in the church. You know, when we begin to worship God, then everything begins to come in its right orbit. Everything begins to arrange itself and fall in place. Um, and, and, and in that sense, worship is, is an ever-enlarging circular experience where as we are worshiping God, you know, it, it leads us into this cycle of joy and peace and obedience, increasing obedience, and it leads us in the right direction. And it is just simply for us, it is important for us to understand that simply that worship is such a powerful experience. Worship is such a powerful activity because what we worship, what we use, how we use our lives, our time, our energy, our strengths, our giftings, you know, to worship, yeah, because what we worship is what we pursue. What we worship is what we pursue. And that determines, shifts, and rearranges our lives, goals, and priority. Worship is such a, such a powerful experience. It's such a powerful activity. So if you want to have better clarity about who or what you really worship, take some time to think and be honest with yourself. And I kind of want to leave this, you know, introductory thoughts to the next part, as I mentioned, where I want us to lead to a, to a passage that will help us have a gracious course correction. So you, you've got to be honest with yourself, you know, and I'm saying this for myself too, that we really need to know who we worship. Um, you know, Matt Redman years back, um, I think more, more than 20 years back, uh, you know, wrote this song. Uh, which went something like this, you know, many are the songs we sing. Uh, many are our offerings now to live the life. And what he meant to say in the song is that we can make so many claims, we can even have religious ex expressions, uh, but we're not really worshiping God. We can have religion without God. We can have spiritual experiences, sort of, you know, fuzzy things that happen here and there but we're not really worshiping God. And, and how do we determine who or what we really worship? And, and here's the thing, how a person spends their time, you know, how you spend your time and how you spend your money, these are the two biggest revealers of what is most important to you and me. How we spend our time how we spend our money. And I'm not talking about um, the time that we set aside for attending a Sunday service or, you know, we give our tithes. It's like, what is in our control? You know, how do we use that? How do we steward that? How do we use or abuse that? You know, where does it go? You know, our strengths, our giftings, our wealth are the clearest revealers of our deepest motivations, affections, and desires of the heart. In other words, who or what we really worship. And my encouragement 
to you this morning is very simple and very clear. Worship God, my brothers and sisters. Worship God. Pursue God. You know, seek him. Employ every aspect of your being to seek God, you know, outside of everything that you're going through and in everything that you're going to pursue him and he will help you to do so. And he promises that if we seek him with all our hearts, if we seek him sincerely, we will find him. So my, my encouragement to you this morning is worship God. Now let's come to the second part of what I want to share. I, I want to lead us to a passage that we normally have not connected to worship, but it is actually about worship. And that is uh, the famous passage of Matthew chapter 6. And I'm, I'm, I'm believing that the Lord would help us all to have, you know, or as many as, as many of us needed, have a course correction and a refocusing and a realigning of our lives uh, unto God is, as I believe, and that's what I've prayed for, that Lord help us to be renewed in our love, in our passion, in our pursuing of you, in sincerity, in, in truth, in simplicity, and how we can really find the joy of encountering God's presence um, as we worship him. So come with me, Matthew chapter 6, and uh, really, you know, uh, very known, well-known passage. We're going to read from verse 22 and right up to 34. I'll break it up in parts from verse 22 to verse 34, Matthew chapter 6. And we see Jesus uh, really saying some very important things at the, at the start of the passage. And I'm going to look at that uh, the next Sunday, where in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talks about some things that need to be done in secret. But as we go down the passage, go down the chapters, and we see in, in verses 22, we see Jesus suddenly uh, brings the, the point of the eye. And, and we wonder where did that come from as we're reading Matthew chapter 6 because uh, suddenly Jesus is talking about uh, the eye being uh, the, the lamp of the body. He's actually talking about, he begins by actually talking about praying in secret, um, giving in secret, and, and fasting in secret. And suddenly Jesus talks about the eye. And let's try and understand what Jesus is saying because these verses, I believe, as much as they can have many uh, understandings. Primarily, it's about Jesus talking about who we worship. So, verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. So then, if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So, if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Now, just the verses before that, in verses 19 and 20, Jesus was talking about, you know, where is your treasure? And where are you trying to store up your treasure? You know, is your treasure here on earth? Or is your treasure in heaven? You know, what are you treasuring? Because what you treasure is what you're going to pursue. You know, as simple as that, as I've been, as I've been sharing. So where's your treasure? Is it in a place where, um, you know, it can be corrupted, it can be, it can be stolen, it can be uh, decayed, or is it treasure in heaven, you know, where, you know, it cannot be decayed or stolen or taken away from you. So who or what is your treasure? What are you pursuing? And therefore, rightfully in verse 22, Jesus is talking about the eye. Because the whole point of verse 22 is, what are you seeing and how are you seeing? What are you focusing on? So Jesus is saying the eye is the lamp of the body. And, and, and whether your whole being is going to be full of light or your whole being or person's being is going to be full of darkness is going to be determined by who or what are you focusing on? Are you focusing on God? Are you focusing on making him your exceedingly great reward? Are you making him your primary pursuit or are you going after the things of the world? And so when, when what Jesus is saying is that he should be your treasure. He should be your focus. Uh, he should be the one, you, you know, we should be pursuing. And how we achieve that is by, you know, refocusing our, our, our vision, our eyes, 
So the Bible should be the lens. And I say this, this is very important. The Bible should be the lens through which we see everything, both what you see and how you see. So, you know, if I can just visualize that, it's literally like the Bible should be the lens. The Bible should be the binoculars or, or, or the zoom lens from which we are, we are having a complete worldview. By the Bible, we're seeing God, we're seeing ourselves, we, we're seeing everything uh, around us by 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 the word of god and and so it's so important for us to have a biblical worldview you know we're seeing god clearly we're seeing ourselves we're seeing everything around us through the lens of god's word now keep that in mind beloved what you keep looking at what you keep staring at what you keep focusing on is what you're going to worship is what you're going to pursue is what you're going to make your treasure further down in the, in, the, in the next verse, no one can serve two masters. Jesus makes that very clear. See, it's, it, this is about worship. No, this is about worship. This is about who you're devoted to. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in wealth, or you cannot serve God and anybody else or anything else. You know, worship is exclusive. It's always exclusive, and we'll come to that. Now, if we do our, if we're doing the previous verse properly, that means if we if we're truly having a biblical worldview, you know, you will clearly know which master to choose to be devoted to. If we if we are seeing everything through the lens of God's word, then we will be wise enough to know that God should be my master. God should be the one I pursue. Jesus should be my first love, and I should not be foolish to go after the things. Uh, that are just about this life, that are that are just here for now, but will not be there for eternity. And so no one can serve two masters, Jesus is saying. Furthermore, for this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life. Do not be worried about your life um, as to what you will eat, what you will drink, or uh, not for your body, as to what you will put on. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? I remember years back, you know, reading this and I and asking myself, then what is life? Isn't that what the whole world is going after? You know, the, the world is completely in pursuit of what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, where you're going to live, you know, the good life, the better life. And, 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 and Jesus answers that as recorded in John chapter 17. He says, and this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And, and so beloved, what Jesus is saying to us, is that don't worry about the things of this life. Don't pursue the things of this life. Don't worry about it. And, and worry, I believe, is a negative form of worship because what you worry about is what you think day and night. It, it consumes your thoughts, your affections. It, and obviously, worry is so negative. So it pulls you down. It makes you heavy. It depresses you. It burdens you in a, in a negative way. It just brings harm. But it's a, it's a form of worship. It's a very powerful activity uh, that people indulge in, uh, even without reason at times. And, and so what Jesus is saying, don't worry. Don't worry by being devoted to the wrong master. Refocus on me, the God who created you, the God who's redeemed you, the God who's created the universe. And refocus on me, pursue me, make me your treasure, you know, no one can take me away from you. I cannot be stolen. I cannot be decayed. You know, make me your exceedingly great reward. Refocus on me. I'm a good master. When you worship me, I bless you with love and peace and joy and wisdom and supernatural divine strength to fulfill my purpose and, and to fulfill my, my, my will for your life. And so change and correct your view. <clears throat> and, how, and, and Jesus gets more specific in the following verse, in the next verse. He says, look at the, look at the. So he's actually asking us to refocus. We're looking after, oh gosh, Lord, I need to make more money. I need to increase my savings. I need to get a high increment. Oh God, this is not enough. Oh God, I've got these debts and these loans. Oh God, things are not okay in my life. And, and, and Jesus is saying, you, you know, refocus. Oh God, things are not okay in, in, in my family and things are not okay in my marriage. And yeah, you got to you got to work on all that. But it's impossible to get all of that right without first making God first in your life, without 
having this divine alignment, you, it's not possible to have divine alignment without first making worshiping God your first priority. So Jesus actually saying, look at the look at the birds. He's actually asking us to to gain our theology and strengthen our beliefs by looking at the birds. He says, so beautiful. Look at the birds. They do not sow, nor reap, nor gather crops into barns. They have no savings, no FDs, no mutual funds. <laughs> they don't. They don't. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more important than they? And why are you worried about clothing? Notice. Look at the notice. Your eye, how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor, nor do they spin thread for cloth. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? But Jesus is trying to reason out with us. Jesus is trying to say, son, daughter, is this what you want to spend your life uh, doing? You want to worry about what you want to eat and where you're going to live and what you want to wear? Is this, is this how you want to spend your life? And he says, don't do that. Don't spend your life worrying. Spend your life worshiping. Invest your life in worship. You don't spend it. You invest your life in worshiping. And you begin by refocusing on God. And let's skip the next one. And Jesus is saying this, and he, he summarizes this. He says, but seek first. Seek first. Worship his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things will be provided to you. Divine alignment. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough of its trouble. So beloved, course correction, you know, divine alignment. How? By focusing, refocusing on God. And I want to say this to all of us, my brothers and sisters over here. You know, here we are, or, you know, we're, we're on the 3rd of October, 2021. Do you realize we are almost nearing the end of another year? And um, how has this year been for you? Have things shifted for you in the right direction? Or have things gone south? You know, And I'm not talking about uh, finances or wealth. That's really not what's on my list of priorities uh, personally. I'm asking about how's your relationship with the Lord? How's your relationship... Uh, with the people whom God has brought in your life? How are you doing with the things that God has commanded you to do as a follower, as a disciple of Jesus? Are you going up on that? You know, even if other things are, are, are being tested, but are you drawing closer to God? Seek first the kingdom of God uh, and his righteousness and all these things will be provided to you, my brothers and sisters. Let's expand this further. So I shared some introductory thoughts on worship and I brought this passage and help us make a course correction. I want to just expand this further. And I want to share about these four things, very simple things about worship. So that, you know, and I'm, I'm, I, I pray that God would really renew our, our worship of him, that we would find that joy again. That after hearing this message, you would take our time today and begin to worship God anew and afresh, you know, just set aside yourself alone and find him again in your secret place. So the fourth thing, the first thing of the four, worship is all about being in agreement with who God is. So when we're talking about worship, we're talking about being in agreement about who God is. As he has revealed himself in his word, as he's revealed himself in the gospel, as he's revealed himself in the scriptures, you know, as we even see, he's revealed himself in nature. And so God in his word, by the revelation of his glory, his character, his attributes, his work, his redemption, redemptive plan, his purpose, his promises, has revealed to us that he alone is worthy of all our worship. So, beloved, we got to make a choice. That worship ought to be our wholehearted response to who God is. And this will determine every detail of our life, beloved. There will be a major good rumbling, a shifting that will happen in your life when you begin to say, God, I agree with who you are as you reveal yourself in your word. And you begin to pursue that. The pursuing 
worshiping God, being in agreement with who he is. Now, to the opposite of it, idolatry is to worship or to have a false view or a false image of God. You know, let me read something uh, over here in Psalm 50, 5, 0, and verses 16 to 22a. You know, the first part of 22a, right up to there. So Psalm 50, and this is interesting because here, God is talking not to the Gentiles who didn't know him at that day and time, but he's talking to the people of Israel who do not regard the Lord, who do not, uh, you know, who do not have a sincere relationship with him. So here's Psalm 50, verse 16, onwards to verse 22, the first part. <laughs> but to the wicked, God says, what right have you to tell of my statues and to take my covenant in your mouth? Now, obviously, that if they are telling of his statues and taking his covenant in, in, in their mouth, that means they are of the people of Israel. They are people who claim to be worshippers of the, the true God. Verse 17, for you hate discipline, you cast my words behind you. When you see a thief, you are pleased with him and you associate with adulterers. You let your mouth loose in evil and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done and I kept silent. You thought that I was just like you. I will reprove you and state the case in order before your eyes. The reason these people, though they were amongst the people of Israel, they lived ungodly. There was nothing, there was no evidence of their life in their life, apart from their just superficial claims. There was no evidence in their life that they really belonged to the God of Israel, that they were truly true worshipers. And, and the reason being is that they had a false view about God. And so, beloved, it's important for us to grow in a correct and high view of God. And for that, we need scriptures. There is no substitute for prayerful Bible study, personal prayerful Bible study, to even read rich books and have godly fellowship in the context of the local church in order for us to grow in God. You know, I, I tell you something, and I, I want to emphasize this. I have seen believers over the years get psyched out, you know, when they, when they move out of fellowship, when they when they de begin to devalue or ignore, you know, their personal disciplines of prayer, of, of study of the word, you know, they move away, they, they keep uh, being loose about their connection with the local church. And I tell you something, that's not something to be taken lightly. I want to request you to be in a place where you will truly grow in God. Be, be in a place personally, be in a place with the local church, be in godly fellowship. You know, grow, ask God for the grace to grow in spiritual discipline so that you will have a, a correct and a high view of God. And that will, that will really fuel and fire your heart to worship him, being in agreement with who he is and not having a weird false view about God. And that is displayed by the quality of life that you're living. So that's, that's the first thing of the four. The second thing, worship is to be exclusive and therefore expensive. Worship you cannot be worshiping A, B, C, D, E. You know, I love God. I love, I love, uh, you know, uh, ice creams. I love this. I love the movies. I love that. I love that. You know, that is awesome. And this is awesome. There's something wrong with that kind of vocabulary. I, I really feel that. And I don't mean to be legalistic over here, but I really, you know, I wouldn't call a, an other sister names or somebody else names that I would call my Farah, that I would call Farah. There are certain terms that I would use only for Farah. And, 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 and that's, obvious, that's obvious in the covenant of marriage. There are some words, expressions, affections that are exclusive, that are sacred. And how much more in our relationship with God? How much more should our worship not be, you know, be exclusive and sacred? And therefore, that becomes expensive. Because in this sinful, broken world, which is lost and confused, there are all kinds of options. As sinful options for men and women, uh, you know, to pursue and worship things in this world. You know, they can worship themselves, worship idols within, 
uh, idols without. The list is long, if not endless. Therefore, for our worship of God here on earth to be exclusive and sacred and pleasing to him, it would require us to be willing to pay the price for us to make and live out that choice. Our worship would need to be a well thought out, calculated cost to the question, who will we worship? Who will determine the choices of our lives? You know, on what basis do you change your jobs? On what basis do you make your financial plan? How do you relate to your wife? You know, on what basis, how, what determines your, your relationships and how you steward those relationships? How do you manage your time? You know, who, who, who determines these decisions in life that make up life? You know, time, uh, relationships, uh, your work, your, your, your finances. These are all the constructions, the sub-constructions of life. You know, how do you make those decisions? Do you go for what looks good just because it looks good? And yeah, that's what Eve did. And, and, that was, and we know the, the, the tragedy that followed do you go for what's appealing? Do you go for the in thing? Do you go for what's cool? Or do or is God the basis of why you make those decisions? Is your worshiping of him, your pursuing of him, the reason why you do what you do or don't do what you do? And so it must be a well thought out calculated cost because I love God, because I worship him. I cannot do that because I worship him and I want to obey him because he's first in my life. I will do that. You know, worship becomes the, the, the basis of, of what we do and why we do what we do. And Jesus himself said to those who said that they wanted to follow him, you know, think about it, calculate the cost. <laughs> Don't make superficial commitments. Don't make superficial claims. You know, in Luke chapter 9, verse 57 to 60, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Luke 9, 23. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Take up your cross daily. What does take up your cross daily mean and follow you? 2,000 years later, has that changed? You know, people who are into hyper grace and cheap grace, you know, would like to skip over that. To, to be able to carry your cross daily is to learn the art the worshipful art of saying no to yourself and saying yes to him. Carrying your cross daily is the worshipful art, is to cultivate the heart and the resolve to say no to Shannon and to say yes to the Lord, as if, even, when, even when it's difficult, even when there's a price to be. That's why worship is to be exclusive. And if it has to be exclusive and sacred, it will be expensive. It will cost you. Therefore, on earth, worshiping God will both be joyful and mournful. But blessed are those who mourn for the right things, for you will be comforted. Amen. So worship is, is all about being in agreement with who God is. Secondly, worship is about uh, ex being, is to be exclusive and therefore expensive. And thirdly, Worship is always a matter of faith. It's always a matter of faith. It's always the issue of faith. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 30, you know the passage that we looked at a little earlier, when Jesus is, is asking, you of little faith, because worship is motivated by a deep love for God and therefore leads to an unshakable faith in him and his word. You know, the very famous passage where, you know, Abraham is, is is has been commanded by the Lord to offer his only son Isaac, whom he loved. And Hebrews eleven in the New Testament records the whole experience for us. Hebrews eleven seventeen to nineteen. It says, "By faith, Abraham, when God tested him." I've heard people tell me weird stuff about this this passage. It's pretty clear what was going on in Genesis chapter twenty two. God tested Abraham, and what was the test? Abraham, will you worship me? Am I the most precious 
person in your life or is it Isaac? Who is the most important thing in your life? What is the most important thing in your life? I want you to love your son, but your love for me must be supreme. So by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned, reasoned. There's always a thinking, a calculating, and a resolution in worship that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. Worship sincerely pursues a well thought out uh, faith based obedience. You know, worship, I'll repeat that, worship sincerely pursues a well thought out obedience. You, you notice one thing in all that I've been sharing in the last, you know, uh, 20 odd minutes. I've not said anything about music here. I've not think, said anything about singing songs. Because, you know, as precious that is, and I want to talk about that the next, next week, as precious that is, that is not really the substance of worship. That's the expression of worship. Worship is this, what I'm talking to you about. Worship is, is, is exclusive. Worship is expensive. Worship is God being first and central in your life. And a worship is about employing everything in within you and around you in order to keep God first in your life. And when you express that in song, it's meaningful and beautiful. But if that's not happening in your life and you just sing songs, then it has no meaning. It has no meaning. The fourth thing. So the third thing I, sh I shared was worship is always a matter of, of faith. And D, worship is always inseparably connected to hope. Oh, wow. Because that verse that we just read in Hebrews 11, 17 to 19, it says in, in verse 19, it is to Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned, is what God said to Abraham. So Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. You know, all our hope is rooted in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot relate or expect anything from a dead God. So all our not yet answered prayers, not yet fulfilled dreams and desires, everything and all that I and you hope for is directed towards Jesus. And it's because of this glorious fact that Jesus Christ is alive, risen, victorious, and gloriously seated on his throne that we can have hope for everything that is according to God's will for our life. And so, beloved, I want to encourage you to worship God in hope. You know, maybe you're in a situation right now and, you know, things are really in, in not in a good place. So worship in faith, and worship in hope. So I just want to summarize, um, you know, what I've just shared with you, uh, you know, today. Firstly, I shared some introductory thoughts about divine alignment. I shared with you about how worship is the activity, the powerful activity that will cause a divine alignment in your life. You cannot expect a divine order to come in your life or a divine alignment to come in your life without you first pursuing God in worship. But when you begin to pursue God in worship, things will begin to come in its orbit. Things will begin to get aligned. God will give you the wisdom and the strength to make the right choices to set your priorities right in life. I secondly then took you to a, to a passage that would help you get a gracious course correction, which we looked at in Matthew chapter 6. You know, where Jesus is asking us to keep, and keep a check on what are we viewing, how are we using our eyes. And Jesus is asking us to look at and learn from the birds, look at the lilies of the field, and to not spend and waste our lives on worrying about things that are meant to follow us but he's asking us to worship him, you know, the only true God. And he said, when you seek the king, when you seek his kingdom, when you seek his righteousness, then things that are meant to follow us will follow us. Don't try to pursue the things that are meant to follow us. Pursue Jesus, pursue God and worship. And those things will follow us. Thirdly, I just shared with you very quickly about four things about worship. Worship is all about being in agreement with who God is. Don't have a false view about God. Don't have an idolatrous view about God. Have a view of God that is scriptural, that is biblical, 
And so there is no substitute for rich Bible study, for personal Bible study, for godly fellowship. Be in the midst of godly people. Don't spend your life with people who, are, who make claims. Don't get influenced by them. Who make claims but are living lives that are contradictory to God's word. You're going to waste your life. You're going to get harm on yourself. You know, be an influencer to them, but know where to draw the line. Secondly, worship is to be exclusive and therefore expensive. And, and, and so we, we have to believe God that we should be able to think out the price that we need to pay and make that good choice of worshiping God, even when things are difficult in our lives. That leads us to the third thing, that worship is always a matter of faith. And we looked at that in the life of Abraham, where by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. If you actually look at the story, uh, it was a three-day journey from his house to Mount Moriah, where he had to go and sacrifice Isaac. God gave him three days to think about it. And Abraham made the good choice by faith and even by hope. That's the fourth thing. Worship by hope. Faith and hope are inseparable. Two different things. Faith is for now. Hope is for the future. But they are inseparable. And so Abraham had both faith and hope that, Lord, you've, you've commanded me. This is the son through whom you've said that I will bless your descendants. I will bless you uh, with uh, a descendants as, as, as large or as numerous as the sands on the seashore. God, I offer him to you in faith and even with hope that God, you promise you can raise him up even from the, from the dead. And so I want to encourage you, my brothers and sisters, believe God that this week will be a renewal of your worship life, that God will just renew your love for him, your passion for him, and you will just be able to be restored back to that sweet joy. You will receive that sweet joy of having daily encounters with God and enjoying his presence, finding your intimacy back with him as you pursue him with everything that is within you. The Lord bless you and have a worshipful week. And let it not just be for this week, but for all the days of your life. Next week, I'll be sharing some more important things about worship that is pleasing to the Lord. The Lord bless you. Mm -hmm.